so it'll be very popular instead of <laughs> Oh yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, right. Minerva, the reading is about to take place. Hang up the phone. Hang up the phone. Everybody shut off your cell phones, please. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to hear your introduction. Put my cell phone and give you one for $5. Pardon? It's on the four minutes to six. Okay. Do you buy your book? Does anyone else want to drink or eat?
could not come in. And they had a younger woman back in Brother named Boston, who was born back and forth from New York to DC. And the baby sister, Minerva, had already been married in 1890 to one more prominent man because he was a master. He filed in with another suffragette, uh, McNair. So Minerva from McNair committed suicide in 1906. At this time, uh, Grandfather Sanskrit was dating already dating women. And at some point, about 1909, he said to her, let's get married. And she said, well, okay, she said, but Sam, she said, what I really want is a trip. Wonderful thing, but she really wanted a friend. So they got married in 1910. They, she gave birth to a beautiful baby girl. The Mulberry newspapers reported it as Louise Quatter. Yeah, it was Louise or whatever Quatter. Louise Quatter, uh, one of Mulberry's pretty society girls who gave birth to a baby girl in her book. Boston friend, I guess, Boston was homosexual. So they married, my mother was born. Two years later, Lulu was pregnant again, and she was giving birth in the home. And the doctor came to Sam and said, look, this baby is too big. You have two choices. I can give her a C-section and she will die. She's too exhausted. Or I can crush the baby's skull and take it out, and she will live. So Sam, who, oh, by the way, I forgot to see this. Look, Sam's a Protestant, and Lulu is a Catholic. So he was a true friend. So the Protestant didn't always burn money or sober. He was a true friend because he wasn't he wasn't required by mythological men to save the child over the love. So he said, I want my wife a lot. Crush the baby stone and take it out. So in 1912, the doctor killed the baby and Lulu lived. In 1914. Yes. Lulu gave birth to Alexander Time and Prim. The second named after Uncle Alex. Right. Well, oh, the third. He's the fourth. Oh, you're the fourth. Oh, okay. So, okay. That I can get all the emotional details. Uh, <laughs> Sam and Lulu. Oh, I forgot to say, Lulu loved playing piano. She really loved it. We called her Aga. We called her Baba. She was playing the piano. 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 But and I never met Sam because Sid was we said he got sick. We had no piano to tell her everything he had he had for years. Anyway, he proved his friendship to his wife by keeping her alive, eschewing in theology, eschewing the Catholic Church of choosing the child of the mother. And she had first her father and then Louise and then Fairtain. And with that, I'm going to introduce my cousin, the grandson of Lulu and Sam. And Louise. Sister Alexandra for inviting 
the H as my wife Kathy in the green t-shirt. I want to thank Kathy uh, for uh, helping me organize this book. This book came out a year ago. And I brought some copies. I'm not going to do a big sales routine. We have a special price, $20 for the book. On Amazon, it's $35. But there is an e-book that is available for $16 also on Amazon. Yeah. Tell us the library is all buying it. Hotels aren't buying it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can get it through your library book, probably. But I'll sign a copy. I have two other books here done earlier. One about working on a farm in the Ozarks. Another about being in Vietnam. Fifty years ago. Is that short time? Yes. So, uh, and uh, right now I am going to play the CD that is the first story in the book. And this story is told by the woman who uh, I transcribed the interview and put it in the book. But it's better to hear her words. So we're going to play, play here. Let's see, we got the CD going. Transcription I'm going to read, which is really tells what it's all about. This is a interview I did when working at Fort Leonard Wood, uh, doing all history projects, and this is one of the best interviews uh, I've ever recorded. This story is from a woman named Ellie Hatch uh, at a farm near Plato, Missouri, which is near the upper uh, Big Piney River in the center part of the state. We'll talk more about the Big Piney. And this stands out as the greatest oral history that I have ever recorded. So this is her words from Plato, Missouri. My grandfather was a professional hunter. Now that was a big thing a hundred years ago. I'm, this is, I'm saying this parenthetically. Uh, People used to hunt for the market, but this man did something a little different. By that, Elliot has said, I mean he had dogs and horses and guns. He would go to a farmer's house, and the family would keep him, feed his dogs and him and his horses till he killed all their winter's meat. Killed and cured, they salted it, killed their winter's meat. This was my grandfather, James Meadows. Whenever they had all they wanted, then he'd go on to the next farm, and he would kill and cure their meat for the winter. I think he started in about October, and went all through the winter. What he got out of it was his robe and his boar and his furs. The furs from the animals he killed, the skins and the furs. He went from farm to farm doing this. By spring, he would have a wagon load of furs and skins, and he would take them to St. Louis and sell them. This would be his money for that year. Evidently, they got 
they were a pretty good price. The furs were this big particular year. My grandfather had come to all the other farms and got their winter's meat. And then it came spring. It was time to come to St. Louis and sell his furs. So he started up to St. Louis with his wagon load of furs piled up, you know, and skins and so on. Just about to move to Walla the first day. He camped out that night and slept under his wagon. He built a fire and eventually he got too much fire, too close to the hides. And you know, I don't know what you know about skins, but they're very, they'll burn quick. A lot of suet on them, dry suet. That's like grease. So the wagon and the furs caught on fire and burned up. Well, that burned up all my grandfather's property. He didn't have anything else. That's all he had, that wagon and his horses and his dogs and his guns and the furs. So that put my grandfather out of business. After that, he didn't go back into the business anymore. He decided he was too old for all that. He went out to California and stayed with my aunts. That was his daughter's, and he lived out there until he died. So this story shows what it takes to make a living in the Ozarks. Not only a century ago, but still, this is a rough place to live. You've got to be clever, never give up, laugh and have some good friends, if not family in California. This is Hatch tells more stories in parts four and eight of this little book. Uh, the story in part eight is an interview uh, she told about a folklore, folklore object called the bulldog cane. And this was a cane that was made from a bull's penis. And uh, she gave this cane to David Leatherman on this program. <laughs> and David Leatherman took one look at this cane and he dropped it and said, let's go back to talking about archery and hammering. <laughs> and it's a very funny interview. And that's in part uh, for this book. Sometimes I wish I could have put recordings in this book of the many folks I've interviewed over the years. But our technology changes so fast, you could probably find a lot out about her and others in these pages on the internet. Her words as written themselves are enough. Uh, how many of you have seen the television show? If it's on. Uh, Ozark. How many have seen Ozark? <laughs> uh, about, about a third of you. It's about the Clintons. Right. And <laughs> all kinds of other Ozark characters. How about, I mean, have you seen a movie that came out five or six years ago called Winter's Bone? It was one of the first films that Jennifer Lawrence starred in when she was a teenager. And uh, Neither of these films or programs are really accurate about the Ozarks because the Ozarks are a huge place. It is big, as big as modern day Greece. It's uh, 50,000 square miles. It is a huge area. It covers southern Missouri, uh, northern Arkansas, and lots of Oklahoma a little bit of Kansas, and a tiny bit of Southern Illinois. And um, one person I know says the Ozarks are 60% in Missouri, 30% in Arkansas, and the rest is in Oklahoma, and less than 1% is in Kansas and Illinois. How did they get the name Ozarks? Uh, the Ozarks comes from a French term, A-U-X-A-R-C-S, and they spelled it in the English way, Ozarks, O-Z-A-R-K-S. There is a river to the south in Arkansas 
called the Arkansas River, and that flows out of Colorado going east towards the Mississippi River. Okay, I've got uh, four more stories. I've got little short stories because Minerva told me there would be some good food and drinks here tonight. So I want to keep this short. Uh, the next story is uh, based on something I read uh, recently uh, in the New Yorker, the uh, December 16, 2019 New Yorker. Uh, it has to do with the band named uh, Moondog. Did any of you know who Moondog was? Yes. Yeah. Oh, good. Good. Well, this is a story about Moondog. He was an Ozark guy. I, uh, after I got out of Vietnam, I went to grad school in political science. Uh, and then I got a job in Rolla, Missouri, on a newspaper. Rolla is 100 miles southwest of St. Louis on Route 66. It's a nice, small university town. And I really enjoyed working there. I had to come up. My job was to come up with one local story every day. I worked five days a week, so I had to come up with five or more stories every week. And uh, after a year of doing that, I decided to come east. Because I knew I had to see other parts of the world. Because I had seen enough of Vietnam, I wanted to see what was happening in the east. So I moved to Philadelphia, and uh, this is my story about moving off. It's called Visiting Moon Dog in Manhattan. This memoir helped me recall the aspects of living on the East Coast for a few years. I enjoyed Philadelphia, especially some of the small Quaker meetings in town and out to the rural areas of Pennsylvania and New Jersey. I've had trouble sleeping this evening, having just read a review called Moon Dog on the streets of New York in the New York Times, or in the New Yorker magazine. I had a brief visit with this blind musician long ago when in the city. Many times in the early 1970s, I was able to hang out with the Big Apple. I had a friend trying to break in as an artist. My father had once invited me to join him on flying on the Pulitzer Company airplane to LaGuardia. My father was also a journalist, but then he became more of a businessman for the Pulitzer Publishing Company. So that's how he got to go on the plane. One of my strongest memories of this visit is saying goodbye to my dad once he had reached his hotel, Midtown Hotel, and walking down to a subway for the village on a pleasant winter afternoon. What are you smiling about, Mr. Sunshine? A bummy looking guy scowled at me. I had no idea being a Midwestern rude was all over me. Moondog was not that kind of old guy. He didn't look like a bum as we stood by as he stood by a midtown modern office building on Sixth Avenue, wearing a cape and his Viking helmet. He had a sign asking for donations and some kind of instrument to offer a musical interlude. I forgot. I forget what we discussed, but he made an impression as a happy, creative soul. And not a freeloader in the heart of the city. Manhattan rang with creative energy then, before the real estate boom made so many places too expensive for young artists. I was on the board of a group called Vietnam Veterans Against the War about this time and came to Manhattan to plan Operation Dewey Canyon 3 in 1971. That's when we took over the Capitol and uh, I worked with John Kerry in bringing over a thousand uh, Vietnam veterans to the wall in Washington. 
Some of our members were making films about the war. Using a radical, minimalist approach, the most important film focused on the Winter Soldier investigation, which led recent, well, let recent veterans tell about horrific war crimes they had experienced. The sculptor Richard Serra and other artists were affiliated with this group. My friend Charlotte from the Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture had moved to Brooklyn. We had a deep connection, but I couldn't commit to any kind of relationship because the Vietnam War was still raging. Also, I hadn't really developed a career, was undecided about where I was going. Another friend had moved to Soho in Lower Manhattan because his paintings began selling at the nearby Ivan Park Gallery. The former assistant to the sculptor Ernest Trova in St. Louis, Richard Joe Perrion had discovered something that was totally new in painting. Richard used automobile enamel paint to spray abstract designs on one side of a clear vinyl machine. Because he learned how different colors interacted, once the vinyl was stretched over a white canvas, incredible layerings of colored glazes seemed totally fresh because the viewer was seeing through the shiny surface of the vinyl into the vibrant designs. It was a little like encountering an ornate cold and saxophone solo brought to life as a dazzling painting. Richard was selling everything he could paint. Unfortunately, sudden success caused problems. Richard became paranoid. The mafia, he felt, wanted to kill him because his work would make their investments in other recent contemporary art worthless. His neighbors were fascinated. The, uh, uh, the sculptor Alan Surrett lived downstairs from him on Spring Street, and a guy named Daffy who played loud music all night long in the ovens. But Richard lost his Soho walk and never was able to get back his groove again. This didn't happen to Moondog. The recent review pointed out that Moondog also had Ozark roots from Batesville, Arkansas. Also, also elsewhere in Missouri and Kansas, where he was blinded by an accident as a teenager. After high school, he went to music school briefly in Memphis, then on to New York, which harbored, harbored him and his Viking heritage, led him to finally settle in Europe. I lived uh, in rural New Jersey for a couple of years and occasionally enjoyed the downtown art scene. I remember hanging out at Max's Kansas City with Richard, hearing Susan Sontag pull forth at openings, Gilbert and George from England doing mysterious ghostly performances and other boundary-pushing events. But I always had, at the back of my mind, getting back to the Ozarks, folks and rivers, everything else seemed like a slideshow. So that's my favorite of the new class. Okay. This next little story is sort of a riddle. Uh, it describes something that the story will explain, and you have to guess what this kind of activity is. traveling in the Ozarks. Do you think two men and one horse could cover 150 miles in two days? 
Can you guess how they could do that? This is a story I heard while doing storytelling, is that they would stub borders. The famous Ozark Timberman and a river rat. I did storytelling for a church and other groups because I was amazed by stub borders stories as retold in George Clinton Parker's book, The Backwoodsman, Daring Men of the Ozarks, published in Boston by Christopher Publishing in 1940s. This book by Clint Arthur, The Backwoodsman, can be found online in the, uh, library, the Lilly Library at the University of uh, Indiana as it's available for free. This story describes how two men walked the old White River Trace, originally a Native American trail that became U.S. Route 66. You have to put yourself back in the early 1820s when Timberman set up the first sawmills on the Big Pine River. They could wrap pine timber down the Big Pine River to the Gasconade River, then from there into the Missouri River, and then sell their raft in St. Charles for cash and a horse. This is how I heard the story, and this is how I can tell it. So you have to picture state of Missouri is sort of a rectangle, and right in the middle is this river called the Big Piney. And it got its name because there were uh, probably several thousand square miles of pine timber in that section of the lower section of the Ozarks. But there was no pine timber around St. Louis. And pine is a lot easier to work than oak. There's a lot of oak trees in the Ozarks. But this was the only place where they could wrap uh, pine timber to the north on the Big Pine River in the Gasconade River. That was named by French fur trappers. They, the French had settled the Ozarks after about 1720. They came down from Canada. The French named many of the rivers. So the Gasconade flows north to the Missouri River, which flows out of the west into the Mississippi near St. Louis. So, yeah. Is that really unusual that a river flows north? Yes. yes, it is. There are not many rivers that flow north. Yeah. The Mohawk River. Yeah, the big, yeah, the Mohawk River. There's a few. So the early settlers realized that this uh, river uh, in Missouri, they could get pine timber to where the place was really growing. And you still see big uh, buildings in St. Louis that have top pine timbers that thick, two feet thick, that hold up the uh, building. So this is how I heard the story. Well, let's say there were two guys, Daniel and Joseph. Daniel would start down the trail. This would be the trail from St. Charles going back to the Big Pine River. They were, one of them, Danny would be uh, riding the horse. After a few miles, Danny would tie up their horse and keep on walking down the trail. In an hour or two, Joseph would come up to where his friend had tied up their horse. Joseph would then untie the horse, jump on board, and ride, and ride down the trail. And after a short while, would catch up with Daniel and then keep riding for another mile or two. Then Joseph would tie up the horse and keep walking down the trail. Eventually, Daniel would come up to where Joseph had tied up their horse, and he would get on it for a second ride. After a short while, he would pass up Joseph, then tie up the horse again, so his friend eventually could have another ride. They would take turns like this all day long and go 70 or 80 miles on an average day. Do you know what this process is called? Pony Express. Hitchhiking. That's the real derivation of the term hitchhiking. <laughs> Usually in our time, 
hitchhiking refers to drivers picking up riders alongside the road. This method of long distance travel is a little different than the modern meaning. It allowed both men and their horse a chance to take a break and still cover a lot of territory that describes this process. It must be centuries old. Uh, my friend, Dr. Jerry Cohen, who has taught linguistics at the University of Missouri at Rolla for many years, told me once that it would be worth researching how the term hitchhiking may have developed among early timber workers or other people all over the world. Check out your online etymological dictionary for any other derivations of this term. So now you know where the term hitchhiking <laughs> Okay, uh, next I have uh, a little story from Arkansas. Now, Arkansas is the state to the south of Missouri. It uh, is the home of a lot of interesting people we heard about Bill Clinton. And it's also a home of where Maybe some of you have spent some money. The Walmart Corporation. That's where Walmart has their headquarters, and it is really amazing. The, uh, the second generation is sort of taking over in some ways now. And they are headquartered in northwest Arkansas in a county seat called Bentonville. And they are tearing down a lot of the older buildings and they're building a, a nine square block new campus. It's going to be very modern. It's going to look like the Apple headquarters out in California. And Walmart is really doing some interesting things now. The younger generation may be a little bit more liberal. We have heard that when well, we were in uh, Bentonville uh, in February, I think it was. Pardon? December. After the uh, January 6th committee of the U.S. House of Representatives finished their final hearing and they were ready to pass on the report, and one of the speakers was a Republican named Liz Cheney. And maybe some of you heard Liz Cheney speak about uh, some of the events on January 6th. Well, the Walton family flew Liz Cheney out to the Crystal Bridges Art Museum in Bentonville, which is a nice museum. And uh, the last hearing ended at two o'clock. She had a nice stand in Arkansas at five. Right. Or six, and she walked out at six with Alice and her family. Yeah, Alice and her family walked out first, and everyone stood up. Maybe. 2,000 people in this auditorium, and we all applauded the Walton family, and we all sat down, and then Liz Cheney walked out, and everyone stood up and applauded again. So I think the Walton family is good, maybe do some things. They have an art museum that is really community-oriented, like this place. You're sort of like, you want to write Alice Walton? You've got a big friend. <laughs> she is. Yeah, I mean, they, she wants grassroots things. Yeah, that's and I uh, think yeah. the Walton family might I support this. I feel so much better about the dirt than that. Okay, this, this story is, uh, Alice Walton has a, a real fascination for quartz crystals, and this is a story uh, of, of, that mentions Alice Walton. It's called uh, Magic Quartz in Mount Ida. This is a story of a visit occurring on a typical drive through Arkansas. It's not hard to find something unusual in Arkansas. These mountains, mountainous ridges, create a 
would create rolling farmland where two lane highways follow forest coves and twisty curves. We're behind the semi going slow across Arkansas. All of a sudden, the big black pickup truck passes on our right, going maybe 80 miles an hour. Up a hill, the highway breaks into two lanes. One from passing, the pickup roars by us, charges a semi on its blind side, and sprays gravel back towards us from a ditch. For a second, this truck wobbles as if the driver has lost control. It's frightening. Close to losing control, he could flip his truck over the hill. I, luckily, I tend to drive our new Chevy Volt car slowly to recharge the battery as much as possible. That and the semi creeping up the hill must have angered this good old boy driving his pickup truck. We slow down even more. We're on our way to Texas on back roads. It's getting on toward dusk. Some folks get squirrely and impatient, especially after eight hours on the job. I try to keep out of the way. I'm an old guy now. No rush to get anywhere to see me. A filling station comes up on the right as we get close to some town. Been driving almost two hours from the Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art. Instead of gas pumps, this old service station has tables covered with mineral samples. Lots of bright crystals catch the evening light. I pull in and catch my breath. A man comes out of a house next door. Howdy, he says. I'm Jay Manley. I've been hunting crystals most of my life. We get to talking. This part of Arkansas is famous for all kinds of minerals. There's even a state park diamond mine where people often find valuable specimens. I've lived down the river for 25 years, Mr. Manley says. You must have a few stories, I comment. Sure do, four boys and four daughters. Boys are even better than this old guy at finding crystals. Inside his former service station, counters and tables gleam with dazzling geometric shapes. We can't help ourselves. Too beautiful not to buy a beautiful gifts. We start looking as Jay tells us a few tales. My boys even sold a good load of rock to Alice Walton, who started that art museum up north of here. You know what it's called, don't you? Sure, we just stopped by, Kathy says. Quite a collection, but no minerals on display. Well, the boys went to her house. They said she couldn't have been any nicer. What a place, they said. Crystals were everywhere. They had never seen such a house. People say Mrs. Walton knows a bargain when she sees it. Yes, my boys had a real good time at her place. They made a mighty nice sale. It had a lot of good bourbon, too. <laughs> we had 74 folks in our house for that Christmas. A house, a house full for anyone, especially for us in Gibbsville. So there are a lot of people like that in Arkansas. We have a little store in their front yard. They sell all kinds of rocks. There's a lot of rock hounds. And there are a lot of folk artists who sell uh, their art on their front yard. And I was going to read a story about some of the folk artists I've known. And there is one in particular uh, named Jesse Howell. And he was famous for making signs. And his signs are now up in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. There is an outsider art museum in Sheboygan that has Jesse Howard signs, and it is a really fun art museum. And I just think it's wonderful <coughs> the way there's so many different styles of art now. 
You don't have to follow any trend. You just have to be yourself. So I've got another story about uh, an Ozark family. This guy uh, is a real special character. His name was Jamal Clavis. And uh, his his father was a real interesting guy named Orville Faubus, who was the governor of Arkansas. And Orville gets sort of a bad rap because he didn't want to integrate the schools in Little Rock. But he was not really a racist. He just was sort of following the trends. And he uh, did some really good things at the end of his career. He ended up working at a place called Dog Patch, USA. It was an amusement park. And he ended up being a ticket taker at the Dog Patch, USA. And now, Dog Patch has been bought by the wealthiest man in the Ozarks, a man named Johnny Morris. And uh, Johnny Morris is going to turn Dog Patch into another theme park. So if you visit uh, the Crystal Bridges Art Museum, come and see Dog Patch USA, because it's going to be really unique. So this is a story from uh, Orville Flawless's little brother, Doyle, who I met in the late 1980s at the Shiloh Museum in Springdale, Arkansas. After I presented a program on the explorer Henry Rose Schoolcraft, as the brother of the former governor of the Falls and the youngest of three boys and four sisters, Doyle had poignant stories about growing up in rural Madison County during tough times. One of his stories stuck with me. I retold the story at several swapping events. The old historian Roy Reed wrote that Doyle, who inherited his mother's voice and love of music, would become a writer and singer of ballads and earn a local reputation as a singer. Roy Reed was a great reporter for the New York Times, and he wrote the biography of Oral Reed, of Oral uh, Paulus. And it is a really fascinating book. It's one of the best books about the Ozarks. Paul uh, Paulus gave me a set of his songs, which is hiding out of the tape collection. So here's the story. Doyle Faubus lived with his folks way, way up on the White River in the wilds of the Boston Mountains in the deep Ozarks. The Boston Mountains are in the middle of the Ozarks. The White River starts in the center part of Arkansas, flows north and then east, and there's five big dams on the White River now, and then it flows south to the Mississippi River. It goes through an area called the Big Woods, where people say the ivory-billed woodpecker lives. It's a very swampy area where it enters the Mississippi River. So the White River is a very historic river. Doyle had just graduated from the eighth grade in 1932. That was as far as most country kids went to school in those days. It was the hardest times of the Great Depression. On a cold winter night, a neighbor came by to ask Doyle if he would haul a dozen ties that he had cut up high on Stanley Mountain. They'd be worth three dollars at the Pettigrew store. That's on the white room. Doyle would be given a dollar in pay to do the job and another dollar for use of his father's wagon. And a pair of mules and a wagon. Doyle said he would do this job. He was glad for the work. It was not bad wages for a fortune year old back then. So at six the next morning, Doyle had his father's team hitched up 
had drove out of the farm yard in the early light. The ground was frozen, but his last piece of cornbread still warmed his belly. The road went up past Greasy Creek School, then followed further uphill. By 9 a.m., he had a wagon waiting in a clearing, and the two mules hitched to the tong so he could skid those 200-pound railroad ties out of the brush where they had been cut. Just before dinner time, he had found all 12 railroad ties and wrestled them onto his father's wagon. Doyle then had a bacon grease and cabbage sandwich for his new time dinner. Then he started with the wagon down the trail. It was beginning to warm up a little bit. The ice in the dishes was starting to melt. So he decided he knew he had to be especially careful to keep on the high part of the road. All of a sudden, he felt his wagon skid a little and skid into a ditch. Then there was a sucking noise, and he felt the mule pull hard, but there was a loud snap, and the wagon stopped dead. Several spokes had broken out of the rear, rear wheel in the frozen mud. Doyle at first didn't know what to do. He could look across the valley from where he sat on the wagon and saw the farm of old friends way across on the other ridge. It was early afternoon when he got his team on a ditch and rode the two mules several miles back over to this other farm. You can use our wagon for the day for 50 cents, the farmer said. Doyle said that was more than fair. Then the sun was dipping close to the ridge when he finally reached where his father's wagon had broken down and drove up around it and back down so he could more easily load the 12 ties onto the spiral wagon. Snow was coming. When he started down the trail, the sun had fallen behind the ridge. The ditches were freezing. Doyle went as slow as he could. He couldn't break down again. Dark had nearly fallen when he left Greasy Creek Road and got onto the main state highway alongside the White River. He had to go slow on the side of that highway. The team might slip on the icy pavement. Finally, he got to the Pettigrew General Store where he could sell those railroad ties. A kerosene light was on. The man had stayed late for him. Doyle thanked him for waiting for he was glad to get that $3 to the load of railroad ties. Luckily, he had brought along a little sack of corn to feed the mules something at the end of their long days of work. Uh, long days of work. He remembered what his father had said. Just a few days before, he'd been out hunting with his dad and shot a squirrel. His old hunting dog was so hungry that this dog didn't bring the squirrel back like he'd always done before. <laughs> the dog ran into the bushes to eat up that squirrel. His family had to have cornmeal mush again for dinner that night, almost like going hungry. His father was very embarrassed. So a dog was careful to take care of those mules he had left tied up by the hitching post. He brushed the snow away from the frozen grass to pour out the shell of corn for the mules. Back by the hitching post, he noticed a little green piece of paper. It was a dollar bill. Doll brushed the ice off the money and took it back into the general store. Some of those old drunk tie hackers must have dropped the note when they were here a day ago, the owner said. Why don't you keep it? You found it. Doyle said he would appreciate that. The dollar would go to repair the wheel on his father's wagon and help pay for part use of the neighbor's wagon. If he was lucky, he might be able to keep half of the dollar that neighboring tie hackers had promised him for moving his ties off the mountain. 
don't send it with a good day. You end up with a piece of good luck like that. I have one more little story. This is the shortest one of all. I know it's warm in here. Sir, the farmer asked his son to get together a dinner for a 
as many of his old friends as he could fit into their church basement. After a big barbecue dinner that night, which he and his son cooked for the group, the still healthy appearing man stood at the head table. He cleared his throat and began, I know why many of you wonder why I've invited you here for supper this evening. Well, I've had some bad news. The doctor tells me I have an incurable case of AIDS. They had no idea. They, the doctors have no idea where this is going to come from, but they told me I better wrap up my business and say goodbye to all my old friends. Everyone looked shocked. The room was soon clear after the friends shook hands with their old neighbor, the farmer who seemed to be healthy, but apparently was not. After the last guest left, the son asked his father, Dad, why didn't you say it's AIDS? The doctors had said nothing about that. The man had a slight twinkle in his eye when he replied to his son, I don't want any of my old friends messing around with your mother. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, that was told by an 85-year-old man. Who, uh, and he has lots of stories like that. You can see him on YouTube. If you look up my history, he really has some great stories. So thank you all for being your welcome. Yeah, we're in the neighborhood. 
Yeah, yeah, I was using it. Yeah, I went to school. Yeah, I performed it. I was part of the school charity part of music. So I was really excited. 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 I was so you Yeah, 